Okay, go ahead. Okay. Hello again. Glad to see you all. Um, today I'm going to talk about device tree tools status, where things are right now. And first I'll start with what is a device tree. A device tree describes hardware that cannot be found by probing. Um, and we're trying to expand this definition now to say it's describing the platform, not just the hardware. Is anybody here not familiar with device tree? Maybe you should ask it the other way. Has everyone here seen device tree source and know what it looks like? <laughs> oh, it is way too complicated. Um, so I've, I've been doing talks about device tree for a few years now. And almost every time I, my talks start with a slide like this, the first few lines, why give a talk about device tree? And basically it's because debugging device tree is hard, understanding device tree is hard. And I've never found anybody who said that device tree was easy. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the problems is that there aren't very many tools, or the tools that exist aren't very good. And so I started working on these things, and that led me to becoming invited to being a device tree maintainer. So now I'm one of the two device tree maintainers in the kernel. And so it, this claim goes all the way back to 2015. I also have, have said this a, a few times this year in different talks. And things are actually getting a little bit better over time. And basically I'm going to be talking about how, how these things changed over the last couple of years. So here's the agenda. I'm basically going to talk about five different areas of tools, um, starting with how do you compare different device trees, um, how do you find out where device tree came from, I'll explain these in more detail when we get there. Um, some of these may sound a little cryptic right now. Then looking at tools that will help you focus on where to look, at, look for problems when you're having a problem. Um, how to create a, a valid um, Linux kernel configuration to go with your device tree. And finally, how to investigate issues related, related to properties and device trees. So we'll start with the first tool, how to, how to compare device trees. And this is a little bit complicated by the nature of device tree. Typically, a device tree source file has one top level source file, just like your normal C code file. And that file typically includes several other files. And those files might include even more files. And one weird thing about device tree is if you define something in one file and then you include another file later that redefines that same object, the compiler will just take the last, last instance that it found. It's not like a C compiler where if you define a variable and initialize it to a certain value and then an include file later try and reinitialize that same variable, the C compiler is going to give you an error. It won't let you compile. The device tree is very generous and lets you redefine things. In addition to that, um, the device tree can be altered at many times in this life cycle. And I'll show some pictures of that later. So obviously the compiler creates the first device tree image. Then when you're creating a, a boot image, that can further modify the device tree. The boot loader might change, change the device tree. When you boot the kernel, the infrastructure might change the device tree. And finally, kernel code such as drivers can further modify the device tree. So it's kind of a free-for-all. And this is what it looks like in real life. You start with some source code, including potentially header files and include files. It goes through some magical, mystical <laughs> process, chops things up, throws them back together again. And after your system is booted, you now have a device tree on your target, which has been changed and modified in many, many ways. And something that's new and still in process of, of getting completed um, is overlays. So even once the system is booted, you might modify the device tree even further yet. And here's the complicated diagram. Don't worry about the details. Um, trying to s give a summary of where all things can change. Every time you see a red arrow, there's a process that might be modifying the device tree. So here are the bootloaders I mentioned, um, and the bootloader loading into the kernel, the kernel unflattening the tree. There are lots and lots of places. So I'm just trying to show you the device tree exists in many different forms over time, and it may be modified. 
And so I have a tool that's going to let you compare what's the device tree look like at these various points in time. And this is called DTX underscore diff. Originally it was DT diff, device tree diff. But one of the nice things about this tool is that it can look in the in device trees in various formats. It can look at source format, it can look at a compiled binary. Once the device tree is on your target system, you can read it out of sysfs. And this tool can look at all those formats and compare between those. Um, this tool has been in Linux since 4.6 RC1. One really nice thing about this is it's just a script. You can copy it back to an older kernel version and it'll work just fine. And I gave a talk um, last year at ESC Europe, and it's a two-hour talk. The first hour talk was purely on this one tool. <laughs> so a lot of examples, a lot of complexity in, in why this is useful and how you can use it. Um, so I, I said you could look at um, device trees in those various stages. And I didn't really say, well, why would you normally want to diff something? Normally you're diffing two source files, right? So this tool can also actually um, do a diff of two source files. And here's an example, one of many, of why this could be a valuable feature. Um, so if this is confusing, please raise your hand and say, explain better. Um, on the left side, we have an original file. On the right side, I've taken that original file and I've modified it a little bit. So what I've done is I have two blocks. I moved the first block down below, and I moved the second block up above. That's the only change I made in this, between these two files. I just moved the order of those two blocks. And if you remember I said that if you define an object and later redefine it, the compiler would just take the most recent object. So the only difference I'm making here is I have one node, the root node, defined twice. The first time it has a, a property called model with the value of model one. <coughs> and then I redefine that same property model to have the value of model three. So when I compile this first version of the file, in the end, the property of model is model three, model one got overwritten. Now that I've reversed the order here, <coughs> model three is the first value of model red. Model 1 is the second value encountered, and it gets overwritten. So the only effect of reordering these two blocks is that this property changed from being Model 3, the last reference, to being Model 1, now the last reference. And if I just take my normal Linux or, or Unix diff and compare those two files, I have this incredible mess. And it looks like a lot changed. And at the source level, a lot did change. But if I use the tool, it's smart enough to know the only thing that really changed was that one property. So there are a lot of things like this that this tool can, can make a lot easier to understand differences. Just because it, it knows how device tree works, how the compiler works, um, what the structure of that, that object is. There's one real nice side effect of this tool, which was just a happenstance. If you only give it one source file instead of two arguments, then it will go through the whole pre-processing steps. It'll go through the whole compiling steps. It'll uncompile it, turn it back to source. And now you have one single file that's that end result of all that, everything that went through that big blender. So you can see what the device tree actually is going to look like on your target after it gets loaded, if, not, if nobody else changes it. And it's a lot easier to look at this end result than looking at the initial source file and all the includes and pick, track everything through and figure out what the end result's going to be. So this is a really handy feature. The second tool is what I call where did the source come from? So we saw again, we start with a, a source file which may include things things may get overwritten. And in the end, where did a certain property come from? Where did a certain node come from? Which of the many source files or redefinitions? And here's an example. Can you guys actually read that from the back? 
Yay. <laughs> um, I actually blew it up in the next couple of slides, but I can skip those slides since you can read, read it here. Um, so I'm simply using the, the standard compiler DTC, and the dash O DTS says process my input and output it as, as a source file. So it's doing all the processing. And the new flag is dash dash annotate. And what that's saying is when you output the source, add this comment on the end of each line saying where did that line come from? Which source file did it come from? And you can see in this example, almost everything came from this DTS file, line 70, line 71, line 72, 73, 74, 75. But there are two lines that came from an include file. The reality is that the source file included this DTSI file. And the DTSI file actually had most of these properties. But the including file, after the top level file, after including the DTSI file, redefined some of those properties. So the DTSI said status was disabled. That was the default. But this DTS file overwrote that to make this a valid node, a working node. So it's very handy to be able to figure out where does something come from if you need to go back and, and fix something. Um, for example, if you don't, didn't know where status was set, you might have to search through lots and lots of files, see where all that, that property was set, and figure out which one really was the one that took effect. The next tool is a tool that helps you figure out where to look for a problem in the first place. Most of the device tree problems occur during the boot process. And so this mostly applies to the boot process. It also will apply when you have overlays once the system is up. And I'm just going to give you one example. Um, and this is it's a really simple concept. It's just a report that's saying, what is the state of device tree? And you can do it for the entire system, or you can do it for, an, for a single node or device. In this case, I said, I just want to look at the, the coin cell node. And we can thank Mr. Timber for the coin cell node. <laughs> it, it comes up in a lot of examples. My driver. <laughs> it's a wonderful driver, wonderful example. It's about 40 lines long. <laughs> <laughs> and so I read my report and said, I want to know about coin cell. And it told me whether there is a device for coin cell. And indeed, there is a device. It told me whether there is a node in device tree. And there is such. It's tells me if there was a node that had a driver and you don't see any. It says, is there a node that has a device? And so we have our device we showed up there matched up with the node here. So we have that tied together. And now we have a problem. We have a node that doesn't have a driver. So now we know we don't need to worry about where the device was created. We don't need to worry about whether the node exists. We can start focusing our debugging efforts on saying, why is there no driver for this node? Um, so I, I gave a, I, I told you that I gave the, um, the two hour talk. And the second hour of that talk was all about using that report. And I started with a whole list of problems. So at the very beginning that report basically said, there's a problem at step one. And so I, that, that showed me I need to look at that area. So I looked at that area, fixed that, ran the report again, and it showed the next place where there's a problem. And so an hour of that talk is walking through that report and seeing where does that point you in your troubleshooting. Um, there will be a slide at the end of this talk that says where to find this talk. And of course, these slides are on the, the Jamboree wiki. So that's where the examples were given. Um, the tools are not mainline yet, but you can get them from the eLinux wiki. They're available, easy to, um, to apply, it, a few kernel patches, a, a few user space tools. Is DTC the annotate? That's a modification to the compiler, right? Yeah, DTC annotate is a modification to the DTC compiler. Is DTC compiler in the kernel source tree? 
Okay, the DTC compiler lives in two places. Um, it actually is in the kernel source tree, but the um, mainline project for it is a separate project, also on kernel.org, uh, maintained by David Gibson. So any changes to DTC are made there, and then we pull them into the kernel tree. Thank you, Tim. He's my straight man. Uh, the next tool is, I have a device tree. How do I know I have the right kernel to, that can work with that, that device tree? Basically, are the right drivers in it? And so yet another tool, dt underscore to underscore config. And basically, you give it a device tree. And optionally, you give it a kernel configuration. And if you've ever gone through the, the manual process of trying to figure this out, these are the steps that it goes through. Um, it looks in the device tree to find what driver matches that, that device. And it use, typically uses the compatible string. Then once it has a driver, you have to figure out what kernel config option needs to be enabled or even disabled to enable the driver to be, to be built. And then if you look in the kernel config, is that option actually set or not? And this tool also will create um, op, um, fragments that you can add to your kernel configuration if you want to try to semi-automate it. The problem is you still need a lot of human judgment. For instance, there might be two different drivers that match a certain device. And so as a human, you have to choose which driver you really want. So I didn't make the tool totally automated. It just gives you the information you need and makes it easy for you to, to modify the configuration. And yet again, there was a talk I gave. And this talk was entirely about this tool. It was Linux Time Japan this year. And lots of examples of how to use the tool and some of the, the gotchas that exist. And here's an example of using the tool. I gave it a device resource file. I gave it a kernel configuration. I told it I wanted it to actually generate what would go into kernel config if I wanted to add that to the config. And when I looked in the report, and I go to my favorite coin cell uh, note again, and it shows, it gives some flags, which you can read all about that in the, the hour long discussion. They're pretty handy. But it shows what node is a coin cell. It shows what compatible string, which is how you're going to find what driver to use. It shows what driver it found for that. It shows what kernel config option you needed and what was the current value. Again, if there were two different drivers that matched, you'll see two lines here. And both would be listed. And then it shows what is the current value. If you wanted to cut and paste these lines into your, your kernel config, you could. It commented out, tells you what the current value is and what you need to change it to. And so you can just add this fragment to your kernel config, uncomment that last line, run make old config, and now this driver is configured in properly for you. The next tool is um, a tool to help you understand how properties are being used or not used. And this is my first slide of actually showing what a device tree looks like and trying to explain it. You guys all know this, <laughs> right? So what are properties? Properties are things, you can think of them as being a static variable describing, holding some value describing the device. So for example, the reg value tells us what address the device is at. Um, here we have something saying, I don't know how the driver's going to use millivolts, but Tim would know all about that. <laughs> but the driver wants to know something about millivolts when it's, when it's charging this point. It's not better when they're in decimal. <laughs> um, so we want to see, are these properties being used appropriately or not? And we can look at it from two ways. We can look at it from the kernel's perspective, from the driver, from the code. And we want to say, is the kernel code correct? So the questions we want to, want to ask are things like, did my driver actually read a property value that I expected it to read? Did it try to read a value, but that value didn't exist in the device tree? Or did it not even attempt to read a, a property that is in the device tree? 
So that can give you a lot of clues as to whether the, the driver is doing the right thing or not, whether there's a bug in the driver. Or you could look at, from, look at it from the device tree side instead of the driver side <coughs> and say, is my device tree source correct? And you'd be asking similar questions just from the other side. So you'd be saying things like, does the device tree have the properties it's supposed to have? Does the device tree have a property that should not exist? Maybe you misspelled a property. Um, and does the device tree contain a property that the kernel doesn't even use? So maybe, maybe the specification was incorrect. So this tool is not in the kernel yet. I'm hoping to get it in probably two releases out, so 4.11. Uh, at this point, I'd say it's way too late for the 4.10 merge window. Um, I need to do a little bit more testing. I might rewrite some of the underlying infrastructure to make it better, um, but it should be coming soon. And I, I talked about this, it got a full hour also in my latest talk at ELC Europe 2016. And here's an example of, of running it. It's a really nice format in the end. Conceptually, it's very simple. Is a, if you think of it conceptually, you can think of, I have a device tree, and I have properties accessed by the kernel. Let's do a diff between those two things. So it looks just like a standard diff. So console is what properties were accessed or attempted to access by the kernel. And the second side of the diff is the actual device tree. So we can see that the compatible value was accessed both on the system and existed in the device tree. Then we have four, property, yeah, four properties that the driver did not attempt to access. But those did exist in the device tree. And finally, we have the status value, which the kernel did access, the driver looked at it, or the, or the framework, and it was in the device tree. And there's a reason that should make sense. In our, in our node, we had a status of disabled. Disabled means don't use this, this device. So when the framework started looking at the, at the devices and nodes, it read the, the compatible value to see what it was, and it read the status value. It says status disabled. I don't need to try to activate the driver for this. So it never called the driver probe routine. So obviously, the probe routine never read these properties. So it, it can give you a lot of insights into what's going on or, or not. And that's it. Um, at the end, there are some pointers to where those references are, where to find the patches, where to find the, the presentations describing the tools. Any Quick yes? question. On the VK prop, does that actually, how, how does that find that it's used? Is it grep, or <coughs> are you looking at the binaries or running with them? Okay, the question is how did, how did the tool find the information to do this report? Um, it, it's an incredibly simple kernel patch. It turns out that I could um, put in essentially a print K in all the locations where a property access was attempted. And it's actually fairly centralized. So it reports out every property access attempt to the console. And then I can collapse that down and what I have to do is create another device resource file comprised of those exact properties, which is why I just do a diff in the end. <laughs> so these tools start adding on top of each other. So this in the end is a DTX diff. But do you, do you have to be running the system that can load that module, or can you do it? Right, you have to run the system. So okay. when you boot the system, it's going to be printing out all these messages right. every time you try and access a property. And then you collect that off the console or off the D message. So, can I ask you some non technical question about the sure. DT? Because we have some difficulty working with uh, some the DT community guys because they're so conservative to modify the DT guy itself. Uh, so, uh, for, so, because uh, we have many SOC variants and each has a slightly different bias. And for example, we make a slightly different board. 
So in such case, we need to maintain the, some DD values. But uh, this happens inside the company, inside some local community. But it's very hard to maintain such kind of local fixes. So how you can tackle with that kind of situation? <laughs> right. OK. So, so the question was, there would be a lot of variants of a base score with very slight differences of the values and the properties. Yeah. And it's very hard to maintain all those versions. And the comment was that the community is very resistant to, to accepting all these changes. Um, so, so the first issue is changes. And the community is very resistant to a lot of churn because that's why we moved to device tree because board files were churning and Linus got real annoyed and threatened to cut arm off. <laughs> um, and, and it is a real problem. And we don't really know what the answer is yet in trying to um, deal with a lot of variants that are just a little bit different than another board. The, the official answer is we start with our include file, which is for each board. Each board has an include file. And ideally, that top level file is just including a bunch of other files. And so you have your standard definition of various devices, whether it's a UART, whether it's an interim controller, whatever. And then, so you include all those. And then in your top level file, if you need to modify two or three properties, you can do that at the very end of your top level file and override the initial default values. And so that's not really ugly unless you have 249 different versions of your board. And then you probably don't want 249 files, do you, right? Um, you have to have 249 somethings, either those files. What some people like to do is have just the, the device tree and then have an entirely separate file, which is only the, the changes. And so you still have 249 change files. You still have 249 something, whether it's one place or the other. So I'm not sure you really gain that much by, by having something like quirks. And, and we're still discussing should quirks exist, how extensively should they be used. So if anybody has brilliant, brilliant ideas, we'd love to hear them in that area, because it is a real problem. You have more probable hardware. You use more probable hardware. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And there's actually discussion going on right now saying, we have some hardware that's probable, but we also have device tree definitions of them. So we go and read the register, and what happens, and, and we, we essentially ignore what the device tree said. We just use what the the register said. What happens running on broken hardware that says the wrong thing? And now we have to trust the device tree, but we haven't been testing the device tree, so maybe it's been wrong all these years. It's like, you, you can't win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, related to the uh, input file, um, I have a, uh, do you have any uh, good points here? Uh, to the, uh, set up the, uh, let's say, uh, the, the placement equal file, uh, uh, let's say, sorry, uh, set up the, the devices in the, uh, the placement file. Because the, the, there is uh, some uh, the state, uh, status uh, is uh, disabled or the okay. So we can fix that. Uh, so that in that case, uh, in the, what's the best way? Uh, in our, uh, the basement uh, include file, uh, enables all the devices and uh, uh, disable the, the each board or disable all the devices, <laughs> basement yeah. devices and uh, yeah. enable it. Okay. Um, the, don't let me forget that question. Yeah. But that just reminded me, um, I, I have another answer that I should have given you in the first place. I, I said that you have that top level file that includes several other files. Mm -hmm. Um, if you have a board family where you just have a lot of minor variants, then you probably want to have an include file, and that include file has includes of things like the <coughs> things like the interrupt controller, the UR, everything that's on your base board, and then all of your 239 variants would include that file, and then just the one modification. 
So then it would just be two lines instead of being um, all those includes and changes. So, so hopefully that, that minimizes the amount of, of duplication. So you mean the initial attempt is very important. So the query is not the idea to find the structure of the yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even if you forget it the first time, yeah. when, when you come to your second board, then you can create that master include file. Mm -hmm. And then you can change your first board to include that <coughs> and add that to your second board. Okay, so your question was, um, so we have all these different include files. Conceptually, you might think of each cell on an SOC might have an include file. Because you're going to reuse these cells over and over and over in different systems. And um, I pointed out the status um, property in a previous slide, which says if the status is, I'm going to use English words, not the actual specific values, but if the status is enabled, then use this device. If the status is disabled, do not use the, the device. And so the question was, in the basic definition, in these include files, should the status say disabled, so that by default when you include the file, it won't exist, or should it say enabled by default? And in either case, after you've included that file, your, your top level file can change value to the opposite side. And I hate to say that that discussion actually is going on in the last two weeks. I thought that the default was put disabled. Mm. Apparently not everyone thinks that's the case. Well, I think it depends on what IP block it's referring to. I mean, there might be right. There might yeah. be IP blocks that you know every single board is going to use, and it's silly to have it disabled and have every single DTS file enable it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind. Of, I think it's a case by case basis. Yeah. So Tim's comment was that it, it kind of depends on how you expect to use that cell. There's some things where you expect it to be enabled normally, therefore your default should be enabled. There's some cases where very few boards would actually use it. So the default might be disabled. So you might have a cell that has three different devices in it. So your include file might actually have three different things defined. And two of those you might expect to always use. One you might expect to only sometimes use. So in one definition file, you might have two enabled and one disabled. Mm -hmm. yeah, and as Tim said, it's kind of situational. And I think that's really the best answer. Although, I'll tell you, in, in the Qualcomm case, uh, most stuff followed the disabled by default pattern. And then you, in your top level include, you would enable the nodes that you were interested in. That, that has the tendency to uh, result in smaller, well, not smaller, but less, uh, less junk during your boot time. Oh, I see. <laughs> Because basically you're going to probe every yeah. every driver you do. So. I'd like to encourage any time you have a problem with device tree and there's no tool, you just can't figure out how to debug something, uh, speak up. Let me know that there's some area you could use more help in. I'll be writing tools <laughs> for the foreseeable future. They're, they're queued up and there'll be more and more coming. So any problems you have, let me know and I'll, I'll try to solve them. Thank you.